I am wearing a very familiar thing that is from Indonesia, batik, right? But I do it in a Ghanaian way. I'm from Ghana. So this is a hybridity. I practice what I preach. So this is hybridity. And, you know, and members of an, an ethnic group uh, may uh, have multiple identities and they express uh, or index uh, these by the kind of languages they choose to use in particular contexts. So it is, uh, linguistic hybrid is very closely related to the way people uh, express themselves. Closely related to all these uh, major aspects of uh, genres of language used and the explicit choices members uh, of the diaspora communities make as they communicate in their secular environment. So as you can see, the idea of linguistic hybridity uh, uh, struggles around the idea of uh, it's around, and I look at it as a gamut of languages that the community speaks, reads, and writes, and the choices members of this community make in the use of these languages in various communication situations. So, for me, this term is going to be used to anchor the idea of hybridity. So, linguistic repertoire <laughs> is a very important key term in my work. Now, let me do a broad introduction of um, the African diaspora. In, in, in Asia as a whole. I will be emphasizing a lot on China, because that's where I did uh, most of the work on. I, I think that um, I have done one of the most comprehensive surveys of African presence in China and in, in, in Asia, especially China. And uh, I will discuss the specific issues of the linguistic repertoires associated with, uh, with identities in, in terms of mixing of languages and cultures, fusion food, mixed music genres, uh, mixed literary genres, mixed families, and so on and so forth. But in the interest of time, I will talk more about language. Um, this talk was uh, was prepared as a 30 minute talk, but now I've been told that it's 50 minutes, so I'm going to be cutting a lot of things. So please go very fast as I go on. Now, um, issues of language and cross cultural communication show that area studies can no longer be bounded. So the point I'm going to make is that. At the end of it all, I am going to anchor all this in the area of uh, area studies. I'm going to say that when you look at uh, a diaspora community like Africans in China, Africans in Asia, you are no longer dealing with bounded entities. So if I study Africans in China, I'm no longer studying only African studies. I'm no longer studying only Asian studies. But I'm studying a more mixed, uh, especially international studies maybe. Even uh, you know, Arab and so it, it, it's one of the best ways to look at interdisciplinary studies when you look at uh, diaspora communities. Um, now there is a methodology to everything. How do we do it? My team and I went into China, another part of Asia. We went to many many places in China, many cities in China. We also went to uh, uh, Japan uh, in uh, Ripongo. We went to Korea in. Uh, in Taiwan, and we came here to uh, Indonesia, in Tana Abang. So we've done a lot of work, and we've done about more than, about 1,000, uh, we interviewed about 1,000 Africans in China, in, in, in the whole of Asia. And we were asking ourselves questions, as you can see on the screen, you know, um, what is it like to be an African in the, in the country in which we're interviewing you? Who are these Africans? Where do they come from? Which African countries do they come from? How does communication take place between them and between they and their Asian uh, host? And um, how are their communities organized? And how do they contribute to the economies of their adopted country and, of course, to the economies of their own country <laughs> in Africa? And so the entire amount of questions and answers gave us some statistical packages and things and we but I'm not gonna have time to go through all these all these things. And as you can see, at the time we went to this uh, uh, we did this study, this was a mainly male population. Now we have eight percent of them being male, but now in China we have far more females you know and than we have we got when we interviewed uh, them. And in terms of um, occupation. Most of them report that they are businessmen or traders, uh, naturally, because they come here 
mostly those Africans come to China, come to Asia, to buy goods with Coca can sell. And some also come to study the next group uh, in the group in, in the diaspora community are students who come here to study. Um, in terms of uh, age of the respondents, yeah, this is a young population. Most of them are in their between 30s and 40s. Um, in terms of uh, nationality, one of the questions we have always asked by journalists are where do these Africans come from? And we were one of the first to give uh, a reasoned answer. And as you can see on the screen, the vast majority come from West Africa, as you can see on the screen. Uh, largest being from Nigeria. Uh, and there are several reasons for why all this is happening. So the first top ten countries, most are from Africa, but as time went on, more and more from East Africa and southern parts of Africa uh, were represented in the group. Um, returning to the idea of linguistic uh, repertoire, I will remind you again that linguistic repertoire is the amount of languages that a community such as the African community in China or in Asia as a whole speaks, reads, and writes, and the choices the members of this community make in the use of these languages in various communication situations. So we have a, a clear concept to work on. And in our analysis, uh, there were about 100 native speakers, I mean, uh, native African language spoken uh, in the community. There were about 100 native African languages spoken. So if there's anyone who is doubting that this is an African community, I can show from linguistic data, from linguistic evidence that you are dealing with African communities because uh, they speak a vast number of African languages there. And nobody else would have spoken that but Africans. Um, now, linguistic repertoire is a function of uh, the length of stay. It's a function of length of stay. The more, uh, the, the, the longer Africans stay in, in Asia, uh, the more fluent they will be in Asian languages. Um, and it is found that, for example, when I did the survey in China, it was found that many of them only stay in China for short periods because of the visa situation. Uh, the, the kind of visas they get, it just gives them three months, six months to, pick, to buy their goods and go back. So the vast majority of them had problems with Chinese, Chinese language. Apart from the students, you know, who had time to study and to use Chinese uh, uh, in, their, in, their, in, their, in their studies. Um, and the same thing found in other parts of Asia. Um, uh, so the next set of slides are just statistics about their levels of Chinese, uh, the competence in Chinese and English. As you can see, please go back. They, please go back, yeah. They, one interesting thing about Africans in China and also in Asia, they tend to exaggerate their competence in English. When you ask them, you know, they kind of forget, they, they say they speak very good English, but I don't know why, but they, they do this. And uh, when you even ask them about their mother tongues, they will, say, they will say they speak French or English. They won't mention their African languages. It is only when my Chinese students ask this question, they will mention English or French. But when I ask African talk to them, I can then get to know the exact mother tongue they speak in Africa. So this, this, this is an example of how migrants, you know, I use the term, how migrants package and how they pack, unpack and repackage their identities. So as you go along, the question that you are asked, you give different answers depending on the situation. Find yourself. Migrants pack, they unpack, and they repackage their identities. And there's a lot of evidence in my work to show this. Um, let's go on. Um, I also asked a set of questions about uh, whether they have communication problems. And I don't have time to get into all the details, but the short of it all is that uh, almost half of the people say they have communication problems. Whereas the other half say they don't have a communication problem. Why? Because, uh, as I've got to know, these are traders who, who are very adamant about uh, doing their trade, whether or not they speak these languages. And I will explain to you later on, I mean, in a short while, how it is that 
they can communicate with their fellow uh, traders in China or in Asia without common language. But before I do that, let me just do a one minute, uh, two minute survey of the, how it is the everyday, everyday life of Africans in a particular city in China, Hangzhou. That is a city that contains the vast majority of Africans. Can you, can you move on? Yes, yes. I interacted with uh, African community leaders. You can see me in there, and uh, my, me and my Chinese uh, uh, assistants, um, research assistants. And the rest are African community leaders. And I had a lot of uh, contact with these leaders in an attempt to do the survey and to talk to them, to understand the community. And uh, they, they were very helpful. And this picture is quite historic because it is the first time that I gathered all these community members together at a, in one place. And so in 100 years time, this picture will always show that the ancestors of Africans in China are these guys. Are these guys you see here. Okay. Can we go on? So um, let me now, it is not just only, in terms of methodology, it's not just only quantitative uh, methods we use. We also sat down and used qualitative methods. We did in-depth interviews with the, the with the speaker, with the with the, the informants. And I want to talk about a fascinating woman who I met. Uh, this woman, Antoinette, uh, as a uh, anonymized name, is a Congolese woman who is in her mid thirties and she's living in Guangzhou with her family. When I ran into her one afternoon in one of the shops in Guangzhou, she had come in to buy hair pieces. You know, hair pieces, hair piece business, it's a big business in China. And she had lived in Accra for a year before moving to Guangzhou. Uh, she first began her journey in Kinshasa, and she moved to Guangzhou via Kotonou, Lomi, and Accra. Um, she and her family get a chance to escape the instability in the Congo to West Africa. So Benin, through Togo, then Accra. So she moved to Guangzhou only years, eight years ago when I met her, the time I met her. Uh, Antoinette is a very terrible multilingual. She speaks many languages among which are uh, her linguistic repertoire, I was talking about that, include Luba, Lingala, French, English, and a little Chinese. Um, her daughter is also beginning to become language, but there is what we linguists call language shift. Her daughter is no longer speaking her African language as well, but she's beginning to speak Chinese and English very well. So there's language shift. So her daughter speaks French and excellent Chinese because she already attends a Chinese elementary school in Guangzhou. Language shift was already in progress because she speaks neither of the African language that her parents speak, Luba and Lingala. Life in Guangzhou for Antoinette is, uh, uh, is, is, as mentioned, it's, only, uh, it's, it's quite okay, and that uh, her trainer husband, and uh, she and her trainer husband are managing quite well in the city. So Antoinette's linguistic repertoire is fascinating. Um, on the whole, when you ask Africans in China, especially in Guangzhou, and in Asia as a well, whole about their life. They, they complain a lot. And here's one typical complaint. You know, I met this young man in a restaurant and I talked to him and he says, you want to know what it is what it is like for me to live in China? Every day before I leave my house to go to the markets, factories, uh, or even to go eat, to come here for dinner, for African food in this restaurant, I spend about what? 10 minutes gathering all the documents that prove that I am legally resident in China. I cannot walk out of my house, my hotel without my passport, my room keys, and anything that shows that I am legally resident in China. And I have done this for the past three years that I have been in and out of China. It's a typical representative account of some problem that Africans face. Um, a short while ago, I was talking to you about the kind of communication problems that uh, Africans uh, have in China. Let me describe a typical scenario, a, 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 a process that is beginning to happen. 
there's a process of pigeonization in the community. Uh, and Africans are beginning to use the calculator, what I call calculated language. It is an integral part of what may be seen as a nascent African Chinese opinion. opinion. Some very early features uh, developing uh, which are of interest to note. So many Africans are mixing languages, Chinese and English, and the African languages and hybridities, a lot of linguistic hybridities in this community. For example, look on the screen there. One sentence can contain about three languages. So I have recorded, my team and I have recorded people say something like, you know, my friend, Joshua Chen, how much? Mon ami, Cecilia, Joshua Chen, you know, or even you say sister, which is very African way of saying one sister, sister, uh, Cecilia, Joshua Chen. You know, so many, so many of these things are being happening. So this process of mixing is only less than 10 years old, and it's too new to make any definitive statements about. Um, and so a full flight teaching will come in later. I have only three minutes left now, so let me try to go faster. So let me now show you an example of a calculator um, uh, language. Uh, next. So here is uh, it, an in-depth uh, participant observation here in a shop. And I go into this shop and I'm observing the two Africans come in. And they do not speak Chinese. And when they come in with their calculators and, and, and they begin to, to talk to the Chinese uh, uh, salesperson. And pointing to the goods and using basic English or uh, French sentences like how much, come here. The Chinese seller responds by showing the price on a calculator. And the African trader negotiates price through head shaking and typing in suggested prices on the, on the phone. And in African markets, Africans never buy the first price that is given them. They usually uh, would, uh, uh, would, would negotiate that. So the Chinese seller responds with gestures and a basic Chinese sentences. And so this process goes on like this for a long time. So calculator language, as I term it in my work, is uh, a very prominent part of communication in this system. Um, for the two things that I have, I want to put all this in the concept of theory. And I want to theorize all this. You know, we are, as I mentioned at the beginning, we are seeing that is this a a new territory for area studies, international studies, or global studies. Our African community, our diaspora communities, a new territory for these kind of things. And I believe so. Um, it is hard to understand Africans in, uh, in, in China or Asia without understanding the social cultural context in which they grew up in Africa. And understanding the social political context in which they are ex operating in China. And, 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 and other parts of Asia uh, are also related to the to, to social cultural hybridities. So um, uh, we are seeing a lot of interactions, and as uh, Lusa says, interaction of different areas that is to the point that there might be best to just call global area international studies. And I have a theory which I call the theory of a brief theory of global. A brief theory of global um, aerial and diaspora studies, which are used to anchor and to theorize about this community. I will stop here. I don't want to be greedy as a special speaker. I don't take all the time. You can say that you are Yes, yes. No, yeah. Part of the paper is in this in the book, but uh, I didn't talk about hybridities in that paper. Yeah. Hybridities is a term I use now in this new paper. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Adams, and it's very interesting uh, papers. And he tried to introduce new theory and use concept of hybridity. So hybridity is, uh, uh, I think, term used from uh, from agriculture, for example. You know, in agriculture, you have uh, better coconuts if you make a hybridity process and then like then then use also for cultural hybridity. Religion, religion as well. Yeah, and normally if you have a, a, 
after hibernate process, we have a better and good product in uh, in uh, fruit or coconut something like that. Okay, then you can uh, have a question uh, and answer later. But now we move to the second speaker. It's a zone. And since I don't have a CV of all of you, so please uh, introduce yourself first before giving presentation. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, everybody. Well, as a sake of introduction, I could simply say that I am a practicing Roman Catholic from a Muslim country who lives in a Jewish neighborhood. I guess that would be in tune with uh, the presentation I have to make. He's going to put the PowerPoint up, and it will help me actually manage time much better. When it's ready. So the title I have is Theological Citizenship, Gods in the Plural, Moral Values, and the Elusive Construction of Pluralist Nationalism in the Global South. Academics are crazy. And uh, um, a title like this essentially means uh, religion and politics in the so-called developing world. Do you want me to give you the... Syncretism would be more appropriate, which is actually a very relevant um, question to consider. Syncretic approaches to religion. Okay, so we can display the titles, right? I'll try to uh, rush through and just try to make a few essential points. Well, the design uh, of the title slide itself, I'm trying to communicate maybe two things. That, um, in my opinion, uh, that's the S in God. Uh, the three so-called Abraham Abrahamic faiths have had a very problematic relationship with nationalism. Mostly destructive and um, not constructive contribution to the building, at least the management of um, religious diversity in our states. And so I guess what I'm trying to suggest is that an understanding of religion as a very private affair to elevate the civil consciousness of citizens would be something of interest. The notion of, uh, of maybe a secular approach to um, uh, uh, citizenship which would, at the same time, elevate the, the importance of religion. And the way I designed the title slide is to suggest that um, in history, if we understand history as a relationship between past, present, and future, religion always takes us time, uh, takes us back to primeval times. It's the belief and the surrender to events that happened in the distant past, right? That's the first dimension of the graphic of my title slide. The second thing is an appreciation of the meaning of the word religion itself. Religion, it means to link, religare, literally, right? But what is more important in the end? Is it what in religion links us to our cre creator or the supreme beings that are in that elevated realm? Or is it the factor that it links us amongst one another? I guess if there was one question that uh, crosses my intention today is that idea. And I would suggest that religion understood as a set of principles that should link us to one another, namely when we have a common destiny in a given country, should take precedent rather than the belief in that supreme uh, deity. Okay, we can move to the uh, next slide, please. And then, um, uh, by the way, before we uh, move on to the, can we pull back to the title side? What you see to the left is, is my outline. I'll come back to it. Uh, if you cannot read the, 
Religion as a search of meaning also, in the Gandhian sense of Satyagraha, really, the search for meaning. I believe that um, in the context of uh, nationalism in, the, uh, in our nations, once we are settled and start adopting orthodoxies and orient our contribution to national life through the orthodoxy, it becomes also a negative force, to be fully honest. Um, and I wanted to take you back, since the Bangun Conference was really uh, intervening as a strong statement against colonialism and imperialism, um, and uh, speaking about the relationship between these three Abrahamic faith and these thousands and thousands of years during which traditional communities had inquired about their relationship with the hereafter. This is right around the time that we can call the apex of colonialism, where knowledge accumulated over a time that no one can encompass. Those religions that did not necessarily have their holy places in an exterritorial, if you are a Christian, as in my case, or a Muslim, your holy place is necessarily outside your own country somewhere around um, uh, the territory of contemporary Israel, or uh, in the case of Muslim, the Kaaba. Our religion in these times, pre-colonial times, the church, the place of celebration where, was, where it was convenient for the people, where it spoke to them in their entire environment, in their immediate environment. So let's ask ourselves the question in the search of meaning and my advocacy for religion to remain a private affair, instructing the citizen on how to relate to God and then to apply that knowledge in a secular way um, in, when he exercises his citizenship. This, the situation that you have in front of you, describes it all. How come uh, Islam or Christianity would introduce anything that disqualifies this search that had taken time for so much longer because before they showed up in the picture. We can move to the next slide. I try to go very fast and I'm timing myself here, so that should help. Very well. So this is my outline, essentially. Um, uh, past this prologue, it goes uh, without saying that we are uh, likely to see a certain repetition of pattern, like if you, if you read very quickly now the situation in the so-called former third world, there is al almost like a return to feudalism. But now the lords are different. They are the ones who have their fingers on the pulse of the digital age. We just have new lordships, but there is a certain return to feudalism. Second, I suggest that the so-called West, which was the enemy of yesterday when imperialism and colonialism were the rule of the game, they might have something to offer. And I'm just uh, jokingly referring to that principle as don't throw the baby with the bath water. Is there anything we can appreciate from the separation of church and state as the industrialized West was trying to gain stability within their own nation? And I want to make a few remarks on the, the new autocrats, how there is a certain appeal now for a strong men at the heads of state and usually wrapping themselves in the mantle of uh, religious legitimacy. And I want to end this presentation with a manifesto which celebrates how um, theological citizenship can possibly invite a form of constructive uh, spirituality where God is absent, where God in the sense of the revealed religion remains strictly in the private sphere. Okay, so let's get started. Very well, uh, past is prologue, the past is not forgotten, it's not even past, right? Um, that is uh, difficult to context. I just wanted to make a broad cosmological comparison between uh, April 1955 and today. This tremendous aspiration, the new birth of freedom that was almost tangible uh, when the delegates were gathered here, literally. Uh, today, 
we don't have much to um, claim for it in terms of uh, yelling victory shouts, right? We have achieved so little, in a sense, of what was meant to happen in decolonizing the mind and whatnot. And so, uh, to steal the title from um, Jean Ziegler, one of his books, uh, we are maybe living in an empire of shame within our own nation for our failures to deliver on the promises of liberation, cultural, full, complete cultural liberation. As a matter of fact, if we move to the next uh, slide, um, in April 1955, we can move to the next slide, please. Um, in in uh, a portion, a section of his, uh, the one before, please. Yes, in a, in a section of his um, uh, speech, Sokarno said the following, Irres Irresistible forces have swept the two continents, Africa and Asia. The mental, spiritual, and political face of the world has been changed, and the process is still not complete. It is still not complete as we speak, uh, fatally. There are no conditions, no concepts, no problems, no ideas abroad in the world. Hurricanes of national awakening and reawakening have swept over the land, shaking it, changing it, changing it for the better. And I ask to you, have we really um, uh, cashed now on those promises of change for the better? Also, problematic as it may sound, UNO suggesting he's a, he's a Marxist, and as a Marxist, he thought that his social commitment to social justice at the global scale was being done in the name of the ideals of the Buddha himself. We can move back to the previous slide, please. And then another element of compari uh, comparison, the previous one, please. Yes, another element of comparison, if the threat of Armageddon in those days was around the nuclear threat, well, we cannot get rid, even if we are exploring Mars, we cannot get rid of the nuclear uh, armament that we have accumulated. So everybody is playing amnesia with that, but the nuclear um, um, uh, armaments that all these nations have accumulated, namely the danger of having an error happen in an uncalculated move by India and or Pakistan, over uh, escalation in their conflict is still there, but we have added to it now the potential of destroying our own habitat. So I'm just suggesting that if we were to capitalize on the spiritual religious ideals in 55, we have added to our uh, plight rather than reduced it. And then finally, the popularity of socialism, neo-socialism in the 19. Um, uh, uh, 50s, 60s, all the way to the 70s, one would argue all the way to the 80s, um, where it was very uh, popular to put religion in its place, has come back to haunt us with now. In the 1970s, in my own experience, uh, the popularity of uh, socialism and Maoism in the country where I grew in, at the fall of the Berlin Wall, I saw with my own eyes many students, students who were in the far left, they started reorienting their idealism in the different religious sects that were available, especially the Muslim Brotherhood, because their disappointment with the idea of the great uh, uh, socialist project was reoriented into religion. And I called it to the death of God has come in the form of the revenge of God. We can go back. Thank you. And so, um, in the idea of don't throw the baby with the bathwater, I suggest that these are the three ingredients that made the tremendous success of at least social stability in the Western world. Democracy, whatever that means. Capitalism, uh, think of Max Weber, uh, the Protestant uh, ethics. Uh, and this, the Protestant ethics and the spirit of capitalism, my God, my gold, my gold, my God, worshipping the gospel of wealth, where people think that's what Unu was saying earlier, in a way, people who are on an empty stomach, it is really evil.
to be preaching to them redemption in the hereafter uh, rather than providing for their immediate needs and then uh, secular uh, nationalism. I don't have to elaborate on that, but I just want to suggest to you, if these are the three ingredients that made uh, social progress in the West acceptable, I'm not offering it as a model, but I'm saying what should we inherit for it if it could have any merit for us. And they are so interlinked now uh, that you have to take it as a package. And uh, capitalism we've adopted for good, definitely. Democracy seems to be a reasonable proposition. And then uh, nationalism, which religion uh, really separated from the state as well, uh, was relatively successful. We can go ahead. Um, this is a question, really. We are all familiar. Next slide, please. We are all familiar with uh, Maslow, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. And I was wondering if there is anybody who would have an objection that this can be offered almost as a universal proposition that really the satisfaction of the greatest aspiration of humans can be put in this framework and then you are fulfilled as a human when you have uh, in your hands or available in your social environment with the protection of the law the, the self-assigned duty of being a moral person, like of having the tools to weigh the moral um, implication of how you exercise your citizenship, what you are ready to trade for your paycheck, and what not. Um, and uh, as opposed to the bottom of the pyramid, where the satisfaction of uh, physiological needs takes precedence. In West Africa, Francophone West Africa at least, we have a terrible uh, cancer that we call la politique du ventre, where people are ready for literally anything as much as they are adherent of, uh, thank you, uh, as much as they are adherent to the traditional uh, Abrahamic faith, they are ready for literally anything to trade their ideals for a higher material standard of living. So to me, it's really a question, again, uh, from what we've uh, inherited from the industrialized West. If this is a good model, then what role should religion play in how we exercise our citizenship? Yeah, we can go ahead, because uh, this, I am just going to skip over it, because it would be too, uh, uh, slightly too time consuming. Uh, to go into it. But uh, the attractiveness I've given among our own uh, representatives here, there are solid arguments for the necessity of strong men who represent the people, who look like the people, and um, I was speculating about the type of autocrats that you find now from the uh, shift zones of the Gulf to China, for instance, where Depending on how you position yourself towards the state, you gain or lose ascendance and the ability uh, to live a so-called moral life in relation to your ideas. But I have to sacrifice that. We can end uh, with the, the, the manifesto, really, where I suggest that there are, there are many gospels and many forms of gospel. I'm just going to literally read through this manifesto from a Ghanaian, Adam's country, a Ghanaian writer who, in my opinion, has written a short text which has all the flavor of a religious text as much as I could find in the gospel of my uh, Catholic faith tradition. So, for your appreciation. And this concerns Africans because uh, in matter of uh, proceeding to a theological citizenship. These are the ideas that they should consider rather than the ones that are uh, locked in the religious texts they pray to. In a people's rise from oppression to grace, a turning point comes when thinkers determined to stop the downward slide, get together to study the causes of problems, think out solutions, and organize ways to apply them. For centuries now, our history in Africa 
has been an avalanche of problems. We have staggered from disaster to catastrophe entering the description of Kent, ancient Egypt, and see the religious uh, intonation um, by yourself, please. The scattering of millions ranging the continent in search of refuge, this is an equivalent of the Jewish exodus. The waste of humanity in the slave trade organized by Arabs, our new friends, Europeans, and myopic, crumb hungry Africans ready to destroy their own land for their unthinking profit. We have entered the plunder of a land now carved up in 54 idiotic, 55 now, idiotic neo colonial states in this stage where large nations seek survival and larger federal unions. And even fools know that fission division is death. Think about my original remark on religion, uniting us or uniting us to the Creator. It may look as if all we ever did was to enter history, a history of ruin, taking no step to end the negative slide and begin the positive turn. That impression is, however, false. Hope of resurrection. Over this disastrous millennium, there have been Africans like ourselves concerned to work out solutions to our problems and to act on them, to organize the resurrection. The traces these makers left are faint because in the continuing triumph of Africa's destroyers, one could argue the fight between Iblis, the devil, good and evil, of Africa's destroyer, the beautiful ones were murdered, the land poisoned. Now wherever the future seed seeks to take root, it's dry sand, dry sand. Still, even in the defeat, the creative ones left the vital signs. They left traces of a moral path visible to this day, provided we learn again to read pointers to lost ways. Then connected with the past, time and future space through knowledge recovered, thinking Africans seeking one another in this common cause will meet the best of humanity for the world ahead, ending the past and current rule of slavery. You can move to the last slide, please, as I finish to read this. We are not after the slave foreman power that under the killer's continuing rule is blind ambition hollow prey. We are after the intelligent understanding of our realities, not simply the politics of power. We are after intelligent action to change these realities, for we intend, as Africans, to retrieve our human face, our human heart, the human mind our ancestors thought to store. That is who we are and why. So I apologize for going over time. Uh, I can't comment on the last slide. Uh, but I just uh, meant to suggest uh, that the highest calls for religious elevation may not necessarily be find, found in the religious texts that we pray to. Sorry for Thank you, uh, Mr. Shanks. So I'm also sorry because I have to be strict with the times because we are running out of time. And uh, it's also very interesting. So if we see you know, the interaction between South and South people, so they have the rich cultural diversity, hybridities, things like that. And don't worry, we don't really understand this. They don't, they cannot follow the presentation. Don't worry, I also cannot understand what uh, some say. But uh, it, it can be uh, uh, developed later uh, during the question and answer time. Now uh, uh, we move to Miss Heidi A. Gloria from the Philippines, and uh, I hope Ms. Heidi can introduce uh, his, uh, her background before giving presentation. You can we also have uh, 15 minutes for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a professor of history from the Ateneo de Davao University. And I'm here because I received an invitation to participate in the Mantung uh, conference of uh, Darwin's making. I'm very happy to be here. It's uh, my first time in Indonesia and also in uh, Bandung. Met many interesting Indonesians. Uh, I want to begin by introducing the title because it's something a little bit different from the mainstream. 
Uh, my paper is about ethnicity, its dynamics with uh, history. And this is contextualized in uh, the history of Mindanao, in which there are many uh, peoples of various uh, cultural persuasions. Um, I'm sure that after listening for something like three days, you know, to a highly globalized uh, perspective, uh, this would be something in the reverse, uh, reversing the highly globalized perspective into uh, a perspective that comes from below, uh, a tiny voice, you know, <laughs> coming from an example of a people uh, who is supposed to be the beneficiaries, uh, if you wish, the end users of all the grandiose schemes we are talking about in this uh, one week uh, seminar. Um, this is not an apology. I maintain that uh, uh, very beautiful words indeed, you know. Um, we have to come to terms with uh, actual uh, reality. And uh, so in this uh, brief paper, I hope you will see something uh, that, 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 that might contribute uh, to the wisdom of what uh, we have been talking about. Ethnicity, for purposes of this paper, is the concept of shared ancestry, memory, collective behavioral habits that include language, beliefs, diet, manner of dressing, social behavior, and the like. It's synonymous with the identity of a distinct human group, hence the salience, each salience in this study. Ethnicity or group identity refers to the assertion of the group's differences from other groups. It finds expression in a fierce loyalty to the group's characteristics that set it apart from others. In an extreme form, this loyalty may be recognized as ethnocentrism or chauvinism and the belief that the group's attributes are superior to others. When placed in the context of a multicultural society, the danger zones for conflict and rivalry uh, become clearly alienated. Multiculturalism is a modern term. It appears to be a glorification or a dramatization of the existence of multiple ethnicities in a single political entity, such as a modern state, either because of historical factors or some sociological forces, like migration. However, some authors on this issue are not convinced that the current platitudes in praise of cultural diversity or multi-ethnicity in a given society are well deserved. The articulation of plural cultures can only be envisaged within the context of a complex and changing world. In most Asian and African societies, which are products of an oppressive colonial past, multiculturalism is one of the dubious legacies of the colonial policy and divide and rule that multiplied social boundaries among a subject peoples. Cultural pluralism is endemic in Southeast Asia, which is a known historical crossroads of various peoples in this part of the world. This is not to say that the impediments of cultural pluralism in Southeast Asian view makes demographic attribute less threatening to the national quality or modern state and its various staff members. On the contrary, the diversity of cultures has evolved new and more complex problems. Whereas in the past, its ethnic quality coexisted more or less peacefully with neighboring groups, the passing of time. The two new historical epochs, such as the colonial period, introduced new contenders. The presence of a new protagonist like the colonial power is on, not only added to the number of qualities competing for the same space on the ground, it also brought with it realities, such as hegemony or the dominance of one group over all the others. The alien of Mindanao in the Philippines has presently taken center stage in the arena of complex problems that beset post-colonial and post-independence Philippines. Centuries of conflict rooted in the colonial past have persisted, buoyed up by the old as well as new forces like continuing domination, discrimination, deprivation, and threat to life and property. The highly volatile situation in Mindanao is highlighted by the secessionist aspirations of the major Muslim groups and the antagonisms of the non-Muslim indigenous peoples along with Catholics and other Christians in Mindanao towards the imminent creation of the Bansan Moro, a proposed autonomous region for Muslim Mindanao. The latter antagonism is predicated on the controversial provisions 
I will propose bill for the creation of a bonus of moral quality, investing it with some state powers, eventually, which will eventually force the Muslim groups into a position of hegemony of a minority over a majority. No problem of this magnitude emerges overnight. And as with other Southeast Asian countries, which share post-colonial and post-independence struggles for a stable government in a multicultural society, Mindanao in the Philippines looks to various factors that have brought about problems of hegemony in the national polity. The problem is not only political, as might seem, but is essentially a is essentially a complex one, whose bifurcations and ramifications extend to social, economic, and cultural beginnings. I'm cutting off some of these uh, sections also in order to keep in uh, line, to stay in line with the 15 uh, minute. Um, at the time of the arrival of the Spaniards in the Philippines, Mindanao was peopled by four major Muslim groups of distinct ethnicities the Tausuk, Absolu, Archipelago, the Mugindano, uh, and the Wayan of the island of Mindanao, including the Maranao of Lake Lanao, and Sanghills of the Sarangani Islands in the southeast portion of uh, Mindanao. In the course of the 300-year colonial period under Spanish hegemony, various subgroups of each Muslim group came to be identified, such as the Sama, the Libajau, the Atanas of Sambuanga, the Iranians, etc., etc. The Spanish colonial government in the Philippines were part of España and Ultramar. The Spanish term for its colonial possessions in America and the Philippines. Hence, the governors and administration of the colonies were closely patterned after the Spanish monarchical system. The colonial government in the Philippines was administered as a theocracy with the preponderance of religious organizations such as the Augustinians, the Franciscans, the Dominicans in administrative and political affairs. From the religious or clerical standpoint, the perception of non-Christians in the unpacified areas in Mindanao and Sulu was that of an infian or pagan, a word clothed with savagery and barbarism. Over the centuries of Spanish colonial rule, this perception of the Moro or the Muslim as uncivilized, savage, barbaric was also implied by the Christian inhabitants, thus transforming the cultural ideology of the Filipino. The Spanish colonial period ended in 1898 as an aftermath of the Spanish defeat in the Spanish-American War over Cuba. Under the American period, the most notable thing that happened that changed uh, uh, conditions of ethnicity was the definition of Filipino citizenship by the Cooper Act or the Jones Law 92. Uh, this is the first milestone. And unknown to the multitude of the former island nations, they had become all of a sudden a single nation with the same identity as citizens of the American territorial possession known as the Philippines. A new hegemony had emerged that of the United States to lead and change the lives of the people under its control. The change in hegemony from Spanish to America resulted in great changes in the identity of the indigenous peoples of Mindanao and Sulu. During the Spanish colonial period, the different Muslim groups were collectively denominated as Moro. The Spanish word for the Muslim Moors of Northern Africa who colonized Spain for 700 years. Hence, the connotation of the word Moro meant Muslim or one who professed the Islamic religion. Uh, anthropologists uh, noted that the Moro Wars, the term Moro Wars, was first coined in uh, one book in the Philippines called Muslims, but this was in 1973. The Spanish sources uh, all referred to this 300-year-old war as Guerras Piraticas or Piratical Wars. Ostensibly, the only similarity between the Moors and the Moros was the Islamic religion. Beyond religion, no other semblance of cultural affinity or affiliation could be accounted for, for by the name uh, Moro. At the beginning, American policy regarding the different ethnic groups in the Philippines as tribes, which was later changed to non-Christians after the realization that Filipino Christians were culturally homogenized by religious affiliation. The new American administration did not differ much from the Spanish colonial government. However, the former initiated a vigorous scientific study among the so-called non-Christian tribes. Consequently, every cultural group and its cultural characteristics was studiously documented. 
ethnic differentiation had resurfaced and group identity emerged to take its place in uh, political affairs. The trend towards for the non-Muslim uh, indigenous peoples were divided into political districts, adding the geographic and political elements into the ethnic or cultural taxonomy, hence recognizing the idea of territoriality or location as a component of ethnicity. The association of the term tribal with the name of the ethnic group was fraught with cultural underpinnings. While Moros implement tribe, while Moros implement Muslim, tribal, Bogobo, Bogobo, and any other Muslim group identified as a tribe, denoted a separate identity with its own culture, Kum territory. On the other hand, the terms Moro Wars and Moro Province were indicative of religion, but not of ethnic identity. I'd like to take you to some brief discussion about the span of the indigenous political uh, systems because this contained uh, the kind of dynamics or dynamism that uh, work, you know, in interaction with uh, historical uh, events. According to the Ming Annals, this was back in the 15th century, the title of Paduka Batara was given to a Sulu chief who made a visit to the Chinese emperor. Since chiefs usually traveled with entourage composed of their families, together with several of slaves, the title Paduka was likewise given to the members of his family, uh, such as his wives and children. The people of the kingdom of Brunei, whose rulers related to the Sulu chiefs, are also wont to refer to Sulu rulers as Batara, meaning Lord in Sanskrit. The genealogy of Sulu recorded two pre-Islamic Sulu rulers whose names were Raja Sipad, which was a construction and variation of Raja Sri Pada or Raja Sri Paduka. Hence, on this point, the Ming Annals and the Sulu genealogy converts. The titles were used in Sulu up to the end of the 19th century. It would seem the, that in the pre-colonial times, an external hegemonic quality such as the Chinese emperor was recognized among the Tausu in the Sulu archipelago. The recognition of this hegemonic quality was indicative of a political readiness of Sulu rulers to acknowledge a higher level of authority than ethnic norms would permit. In the island of Mindanao, other kings were not also mentioned, such as a Ganga Ibendum from the kingdom of Kumagara, somewhere in the Sambuanga Peninsula. Then there was the ancient kingdom of Butuan, a wash in gold, and probably the most prosperous trading port in the whole archipelago. In brief, the idea of an external sovereign whose protection was sought and whose influence on rulers was made known through the adoption of titles that acknowledged their subject status was already part of the early political experience of the people. The sort of genealogy is replete with names by an autochthonous hierarchy of officials and persons of authority, Datu, Tuan, Shai, Orangkaya, before the advent of Islam. The Datu was the, high, Datu was the highest rung in the soft political structure, followed by the Tuan. The Shai was a religious personage, while the Orangkaya were commoners with the uh, names. The new social political dispensation had to come to terms with the indigenous system by integrating this in, in the significant institutions such as the Dalton or otherwise the transformation from the old to the new world would not have been possible. The Sultanate system gave rise to a new line of Dalton's of royal blood, that is those who descended directly from the first Sulu Sultan, uh, Sarif Ul Hashim, in distinction to the autochthonous Dalton's prior to the introduction of the Sultanate. In the 16th century, Spanish records mention some Sulu rulers who carry the title Pangiran, indicating a member of the royal, a member of the royal family. Nevertheless, there existed local Datus who were not of royal blood, in the sense that they could not claim direct descent from the first sultan, but were in fact older personages than the royal Datus who were descended from the first uh, sultan, Sharif Ul Hashim. The traditional belief that the ascendancy of the Sultanate as the highest governing power or sovereign in the realm took place peacefully and without bloodshed. This idea arose from the Tartim, a narrative of some events purporting to be historically connected with the proclamation of the first Sultan. Sulu Sultans based their political power and other prerogatives such as land ownership on a supposed contract or agreement between the first Sultan and the local peoples who had consented to Islamization. This is a most significant development, was a most significant development 
because it signified the confrontation between the newly introduced institution, which was the Sultanate, and the previously existing partnership. In the confrontation, the latter was then to agree to the imposition of a higher and a more powerful authority as part of the process of Islamization. The important point is that since the essence or source of power was an agreement, it may be safely inferred that the nature of the institution of Sultanate and Sultan was not rigid or changeless, but one that allowed constant negotiation and renegotiation. I will give an example of uh, <clears throat> social justice, uh, which follows uh, a very traditional um, value or belief among the Maranaos of Lake Lanao. <coughs> I'm talking about the Maratabat. Maratabat is translated into collective shame, dishonor, which was individually incurred but collectively avenged by the family and the community as a whole. It was one of those social worries that was strictly enforced to the point of death to the offender. In many cases, it could take several generations before an act of vengeance and retribution could be exacted to wipe out the Maratabat. But the community had a long memory for this and was not known to condone the offense. Unlike other cultural traits which, was, which were acquired or learned, the Maratabat was inherited along with status in the community. It was directly proportional to one's rank and status. The higher one's rank was, the bigger the sense of shame. Conversely, the lower one's social status was, the smaller the Maratabat. A slave could not be easily offended, or anyone uh, belonging, but a dog or anyone belonging to his family would be. And to close this uh, brief uh, paper, I'd like to say that the ethnic factoring in the Lao has played an important role in the long history of colonial struggle, continues to do so in contemporary times. However, there is a dark side to ethnicity. Since ethnicity is the expression of the we against the they, it follows that ethnocentrism, chauvinism, prejudice, and inevitably conflict are natural byproducts of the dynamics of identity and belongingness. Someone has proposed or posited an iron law of ethnicity by which it is prognosticated that where there is ethnic difference and where difference means inequality, there will be ethnic conflict. Everywhere in the world, ethnic pluralism or cultural diversity has been associated with dissent and instability. Nevertheless, the relationship between ethnicity and conflict, which may be understood as a cause and effect relationship, does not really operate automatically. For the complete remarks, through the long centuries of colonial rule and their rulers, ethnicity and not state sovereignty became the only refuge of every ethnic group in the country. In Mindanao and Sulu, the emergence of the Philippine state in 1946 hardly stirred in excitement or applause from among the Muslims and non-Muslim natives. For them, the Philippine Republic was just another successor to the string of unwanted leaderships that has been foisted on them without their consent. The Muslims in particular reacted with great scorn to the idea of a government led by Christians who to them were no better than the Spaniards. At the outset, they asserted their opposition to the independence movement undertaken by the Commonwealth President. To the extent of petitioning the American government for a grant of a separate independence for the Muslims of Vietnam. On the other hand, the non-Muslim natives who were less advanced than the Muslims in matters of social political organization remained passive, unable to participate in the dynamics of the new polity and retreating deeply into their shell of ethnicity. Group identity became their only shield against national or state policies of Filipinization, integration, and assimilation. They have done all along that any assimilationist move from the national government would result in the perpetuation of their inferior social status. And to lose their ethnicity is to disappear into the great void of nameless and faceless mass of poverty-stricken peoples in the Philippine society. 
The cultures and traditions of the indigenous peoples of Mindanao have served as a bastion of group and self-identity. In this identity, they were able to demand a recognition of their cultural differences that justify their separate treatment from society. In this way, ethnicity has become a leverage for leveling the inequalities that exist among the different sectors of the population. Whereas the independence and the emergence of the Philippine state solely benefited the Christian majority of the post-colonial Filipinos, ethnicity has won significant political concessions such as autonomy for the Muslims and rights of ancestral domain for the indigenous non-Muslim peoples. The tension which arose between group identity and the new sovereignty was a, new, was a natural outcome of the unequal social status between the Christian majority and the indigenous Muslims as well as non-Muslim minorities. For the Muslim groups, political autonomy is the assertion of supremacy and preeminence of their identity as against Filipino identity. They do not consider themselves Filipinos. It is not clear for the non-Muslim people stand in regard to the issue of sovereignty and group identity. Ancestral domain rights have given them social and economic rights over their ancestral lands on which they have built their settlements from ancient times. However, unlike autonomy, ancestral domain does not provide political rights. The non-Muslim IPs are subject to the national governance and obey the same laws as do the rest of the Filipinos. These rights do have something in common, which is the element of exclusivity. They are rights inclusive only to the group and not to outsiders. As such, they are bound to give rise to further conflicts. And so the saga of ethnicity lives on. Eventually, group identity has to give way to larger and larger identities uh, as in citizenship. But right now, the need of the hour is to respond to the various needs of the different groups to achieve a modicum of political instability. Stability, strengthening and building state sovereignty will depend on stabilizing the dynamics of multiculturalism and ethnicity. Maraming uh, salamat po, Dream of the Sea. Thank you, uh, Ms. Heidi, for the uh, presentation. And it is uh, about the complex complexity of uh, identity construction in the Philippines and also the role of uh, ethnicity, which I think is immediate moderated this uh, uh, identity. Yeah, we can have a question and answer later regarding this uh, interesting issue, interesting topics. And the uh, last speaker for this session will be Mr. Ian Wardi Supur. Ian Wardi is a lecturer in the uh, University of Hail, yeah, this uh, university in uh, Karnati, in Molokas Islands. So, Mr. Yanardi, you have also 15 minutes for your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say thank you to Mr. Darius Lori. This is my, sec my second time to meet. Him. The first time is when he came to my campus in Ternate, uh, and this is my second time. And today, I want to share you um, about the spread of ISIS influences in Indonesia. Well, I wrote a paper, and you can reach it uh, maybe after the committee. Uh, print the paper. It's about uh, nine, nine pages. I wrote a, a paper. This is a preliminary paper, I, I mean, because I, want, I, have, I have a plan to emphasize the paper to be a book. Um, as a lecturer in the Department of Anthropology at Universitas Hailun Ternate, I'm also a writer. Until today, I wrote more than 30 books. It's about Islam and also Al Qaeda. Uh, maybe Pak Darwis, Mr. Darwis, get one book uh, in search of Al Qaeda in Indonesia. And today, I will share with you uh, the three things, three things about Al Qaeda. Okay. I begin this prologue with the data 
World Trade Journal reports that uh, three, uh, 34 Indonesians have uh, joined with ISIS in Syria. And based on BNPT, BNPT is a national counterterrorism agency in Indonesia, report that uh, more than, maybe more than 500 Indonesian people joined with ISIS. It means that they they reach uh, they they came to uh, Syria and Iraq and to be uh, ISIS fight fighter. And also, if we see or we read it from the newspaper, we can know that uh, in based on CIA information that uh, in Syria more than 15,000 people. Uh, uh, joined with ISIS, it's including the people from Indonesia, Philippines, from Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Brunei. And the ISIS is also condemned by the United Nations, including Indonesia, of course. And after that, uh, until now, uh, ISIS, I think, uh, is a more is a problem. Maybe it's a problem in Indonesia. Because uh, you know, if you if you uh, look at in YouTube and you type uh, "join with the ranks," you can you can show that uh, Indonesian people uh, condemn the Indonesian army and they want to attack with army. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, the first thing I want to share you about uh, the ISIS training in Indonesia. Next. The next. Okay. I have three important things to share with you. Uh, it is the way that I, ISIS uh, spread their ideology uh, into Indonesian people. The first one, by internet. You can see the you can see some uh, radical website like uh, Al Mustaqbal and also uh, a radical social media. They have a uh, close, close uh, connection, and close uh, connection with, uh, between them to share the, the radical ideology in Indonesia. And for example, if you see in YouTube, yeah, you can you can you can see about that. You can you can show the the, the data about uh, how Indonesian people join army, join the ISIS, and how Indonesian people uh, support the ISIS. It's the first one uh, through the internet and also social media. The second one is in radical radical leader, radical leaders. If you you know you know that uh, Abu Bakar Bahasir is an uh, Indonesian leader, maybe charismatic uh, radical Indonesia, and also Aman Abdul Rahman. It's based on Sidney Jones, this Sidney Jones uh, paper, and also Santoso. Santoso is a Islamic Islamic radical leader in based on Poso. He he make uh, he made uh, Mujahidin. Indonesia Timur or in Eastern Indonesia Mujahideen and they attack the army in Sulawesi Tengah in Poso. Yeah, I, I mean that uh, radical leaders is the way to support the way to, is the way to support the ISIS support in Indonesia. Uh, and the third is bottom environment environment if we have a family uh, as a ISIS supporters it can be influence others yeah it can be it could be influence others so the influence of uh, ISIS uh, ISIS ideology it it can be by uh, family by family or maybe by your relatives your your relatives maybe your your doctor's friend or your son's son's friend and another and 
the support uh, supporting for ISIS is uh, about uh, about to uh, I mean that uh, uh, if some if someone have uh, interest about ISIS, they can be uh, either a supporter or maybe a fighter. Okay, next. The first one, a supporter. If someone if someone be a supporter of ISIS, so she or he can uh, can yeah, can be a supporter by by uh, their, their money and also loyalty loyalty to ISIS ideology and also spreading the ideology spreading the ideology through the internet and also uh, networking. What about the fighter? If so, if someone be a, a supporter of ISIS and also be a fighter, so the person definitely want to be a mujahidin, want to be a want to be a, want to be a, one of Islamic fighter in Syria, and they they they, they go to. Uh, Syria or Iraq to join with the, the ranks there and as a fighter they could be uh, have a loyalty about their, their ideology and also spreading their ideology in the internet and and uh, here are uh, his relatives the second one I want to share you about the responses the response of next the responses from Islamic communities. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you know that uh, in Indonesia we have a more uh, Islamic institution, and Muhammadiyah and Nahdlatul Ulama is, I think, is the largest organization here. And what the response from uh, Muhammadiyah is from, for, for example, according to uh, Haidar Nasir, he is a uh, a leader of Muhammadiyah, chair of Muhammadiyah, he said that he doesn't agree with ISIS due to this movement is unpopular, unpopular in advancement of Islam. In Indonesia, we call uh, kemajuan Islam. So, uh, Haidat Nasir think that uh, uh, attack people, and also maybe if you if you saw in the YouTube when a pilot from Jordania. Uh, and from Jordania, death is very scary <laughs> when a pilot from Jordania. Uh, it's uh, unpopular in the defense and the advancement of Islam. And Haider Nasir tell for the people of Ahmadiyya, remember Ahmadiyya, uh, and also for the Indonesian people here, that Islam is Rahmatalil Alamin. Rahmatalil Alamin is mean that. Uh, Islam is blessing for all mankind, all of us. Even you are Christian, even you are Buddhist, or, or, or what or what belief that you you, you, you believe. So Islam Rahmatul Alamin is the key point or, or the key word from uh, Muhammadiyah. The second from Nahdlatul Ulama, according to the chairman of uh, Nahdlatul Ulama, PBNU, Pengurus Besar Nahdlatul Ulama, is uh, the center of uh, Nahdlatul Ulama. Said Akhil Siraj point that uh, the radicalization is uh, interesting term. The radicalization, I think, it, its term is uh, from National Counterterrorism uh, Against She. The radicalization is the most important thing to overcome the ISIS. Influenced by moderate views of Islam, the radicalization, uh, according to uh, where John, where John is a uh, uh, is against him in radicalization, is a process how to return, how to make Indonesian uh, citizen, Indonesian people, to be Indonesian, not to be Middle East, not to be a uh, uh, ISIS fighter or not, to be Indonesian because we live in Indonesia. How to return the terrorist mind? The terrorist mind. It means that the terrorist intellectual, the terrorist knowledge, and the terrorist activities become moderate. Become moderate. 
where religion uh, has a uh, experience to uh, to suggest uh, one of uh, terrorists in Indonesia to be uh, to, to accept Pancasila because you know uh, all terrorists didn't accept Pancasila and religion uh, have uh, has a, a, a good thing to 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 suggest uh, one of the other to be to become a murderer. Finally, next, how to overcome the problem? How to overcome the influences of ISIS in Indonesia? I think that uh, all of us, all of uh, Indonesian people here must uh, have a close connection to African Republic. The first one, for the government, must have, must, uh, have a maybe close connection, sharing intelligence with another intelligence, another uh, country, another state. And the second, Islamic leaders here, uh, uh, Muhammadiyah and Nuhadatul Ulama and another organization here, must uh, suggest, must uh, teach their member to be moderate, to be moderate, and don't uh, feel that Indonesia is uh, a tabu, or that, 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 that do not think that Indonesia is a uh, jahiliyah, yeah? because uh, because uh, some people say that Indonesia is not Islam, not, not except uh, Sharia, and, uh, and something like that. So the Islamic leaders, and also scholars, have a, a task maybe to uh, suggest people to be moderate. And also families, all families here must uh, must uh, protect their member, their member to be moderate. And also local communities in Indonesia, uh, you know that uh, more than 500 uh, ethnic in Indonesia, and they uh, I think uh, definitely they didn't accept the, the terrorism. I think that's, that's all for me. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Yanordi, for the presentation about ISIS, the spread of ISIS in uh, Actually, uh, following the time table here, we don't have more time, I think. Uh, because, uh, but we start late, I think we start around 30 minutes late. So, we will have about 15 minutes yeah, if you are allowing me to continue our this session. So we still have about 15 minutes for question and answer. And, uh, and also, I remember from our list that uh, Mr. Tony also will give a uh, comment on mm -hmm. So you have around five minutes. Well, if you want us to know what is not something I just gave you, 
five minutes, unless we leave it for next time. Yeah, I think it's better. Yeah, yeah, it's period. But I would not like it. Yeah. If, the, 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 the next. Uh, I just leave it for next time. Yeah, it's better, better because uh, yeah, there is a no, it's a little better. Yeah, you can talk about that later, bro. We, we, we should have one more special session regarding that uh, topic. Okay. So I'm sorry about this. Uh, now, uh, here we have uh, four presenters already. If you have this, the key words for the culture of abilities and theoretical citizenship. So this thing is, you know, this concept of being you need to know further in the class. Also, role in the city and uh, identity construction. And then uh, lastly about the uh, ISIS. So if you have questions, yes please. We have uh, one, two, three, four, uh, five. I think we have five uh, uh, comment or five uh, questions from the announce uh, from the audience. So please we start with uh, this lady. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to Now my question is addressed to the last speaker I said. Uh, uh, what is the ultimate philosophy of my ISIS? And why they get attracted? And more women do more women come or more men are coming. So that is uh, one. Uh, now secondly, I also have a question for the you know, you said collective shame. Traditional collective shame. In India, also we have similar kind of community shame. And uh, the result, there is a prevalence of club, panchayat, caste, clan, panchayat. And this shame is more acute in case of uh, women. You know, they attract more to women. If women do something, Extremely supposedly uh, non uh, normative acts like extramarital abuse, so get married outside the car. So they are condemned to death, like uh, Islam and uh, the uh, 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 Buddha. So that is some kind of shame prevailing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. This
that this agenda actually is the main problem of the 21st century. It's going to be a geopolitical battle. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. So, yeah, uh, So, gentlemen, somebody want to ask a question? Yeah. Okay, so, so you can go ahead. Thank you, Jim, for this chance. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate all the participants at today. It was very interesting to know something about culture, religion, ethnicity through sociological and anthropological perspective. As, in, as a student of anthropology, I really again got benefited with your presentation. Actually, it's not my question. I just wanted to be clear as men, from men, uh, you're talking about ethnicity. Ethnicity, ethnic, ethnic identity and ethnicity you're talking about. I think uh, ethnicity and this indigenous, indigenous identity, indigenous identity, you know. I think they gave they do have the same, two parts of the same point, I think. And in the context of South Asia, especially in Nepal, at present, you know, this ethnic identity, identity crisis, and indigenous identity is the major issue. So, but it's not a question, I mean, my point just, I mean, I want to be clear, how would you, I mean, take these two entities, cultural entities, you know, indigenous identity and ethnic identity, are the same or do they have some kind of, you know, some kind of uh, correlation or some differences? Actually, I, I, I want to be clear from my own experience. All right, thank you. So, last comment, probably? Okay. Uh, this... We just... Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, uh, I have a question uh, addressed to the second uh, speaker on the theological citizenship. Um, if you would relate that to secularity and you apply that in northern or western regions, um, there has been a shift, there has been a shift in terms of spirituality. So spirituality there, we, we, we think to, we tend to think of western, uh, that there are more uh, secular than the uh, southern regions. Um, my observation is, is that there has been a shift from um, spirituality that is more based on religions towards that are based on arts and culture, art and music or culture, cultural aspects of culture. Uh, what would you say about that? Do you think we could embrace that uh, development. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, last question. Thank you. Um, I, am, I have one last question to Mr. Jim. Uh, uh, when I heard 195 about uh, Shibaku freedom, new freedom for uh, any day to go Problematizes issue of imperialism and cultural 
uh, and, and the role of you know, these powers on uh, using culture as a tool. In fact, when our panel was asked to uh, uh, state, uh, make a statement about inviting calls for papers, we actually insisted on the aspect of culture. That culture has been used as a tool to subjugate the colonies. And so we must therefore use the same culture to liberate ourselves and to, uh, to develop and so on. I would say that my presentation is an attempt to show how Africans and Asians are agents of themselves now in the new era, trying to uh, repackage, you know, trying to use their culture as they travel, as they go around, as they mix, as they talk to each other now, how they are rebuilding a new kind of culture, a new kind of uh, cultural identity. And I think that it is a way to fight back. It is, a, it is an agency, a certain of agency to fight back. Um, secondly, there was a, a, a question about the difference between indigenous and ethnic. I, I'm not sure how to relate to that, but in Guangzhou, in China, in Tana Aban, in uh, uh, Taiwan, in Korea, in uh, Ripongo, in Japan, you can see all this. The, uh, people are bringing their indigenous cultures and ethnic cultures and meeting other people who have their indigenous cultures and then are mixing and getting a new a hybrid. So I think that in my presentation, there's no contradiction uh, between ethnic uh, identity and indigenous identity. We, it's a, it's a, we're mixing, we're mixing things together and creating something new. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, please next, uh, Mr. Zong, to respond. The question itself was difficult, but if I understood it well as uh, acknowledging a return not only to spirituality but also to religious practice in the Western world, the, the comment I could make uh, is this one. I mean, we cannot all be dumb and die in not reconciling our radical differences culturally. And at Bandung, actually, one of the greatest agreements was on cultural cooperation. In, uh, especially in cultural co uh, cooperation, including science and technology, the larger. So my suggestion is this. Uh, when I observe, like in Scandinavia, for instance, a very strong return to what they call neo-paganism, people like drifting away from Christianity as too narrow, I think we have a very good chance now for a form of hybridity, to speak like Adam, or a global syncretism in the name of the construction of our nations and human solidarity, and it could be at the intersection of three great principles of the three most problematic uh, religious tradition, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. You know Judaism, since it is the ancestor of uh, monotheism, Judaism has this very strong demand on the citizen of the world to repair the world. The world is damaged and you have to fix it. See, that should be attractive for everybody, right? Islam has this very strong principle of submission, you know, to the primacy of God. And I think if Islam would offer to the world as a contribution to this new uh, 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 theocentric uh, citizenship, submit to God, but also God as found in nature, like a, a, a form of submission that is not fully abstract in the sense of the remoteness of God, but also acknowledge the, God, the presence of God in nature. And then Christianity has been pushing its agenda with this idea of man made at the image of God. I think that's a very attractive premise, as Desmond Tutu in South Africa or Mandela have uh, exemplified. You think it's impossible until you do it, that you can overcome major contradiction in humans in society as I offer that as a possibility. The theological citizenship at the intersection of the biggest troublemakers. Okay, thank you, Mr. Jean. And next, uh, Ms. Uh, Heidi, please, please respond to the question. Yeah, it's, this is partly answered by Adam. Um, I was using ethnicity synonymously with uh, group identity. Uh, Indigenous peoples in Mindanao are many, and uh, each indigenous group has an identity to which they cling uh, very tenaciously, like I said, you know, as, as the only protection against being subsumed you know, in faceless 
uh, masculine, our uh, people just, you know, uh, or forgotten almost uh, in uh, the Philippines. Is that the question? Solidarity, 
take uh, bombing, Bali bombing, uh, for instance, is a solidarity for for those who want to be a good Muslim, as they believe that as Muslim we, we are a good body, uh, we are one body, and we must uh, we must have a solidarity to our uh, our friend and our, our brother in Palestine and, and another country. I think. That's oh, okay, thank you, Pat. I'm sorry, probably there are some questions which not been addressed, but we don't have any more time. So to end this session, please be, keep uh, be, sorry, please keep big applause to the presenter. Thank you. Thank you.